Hey, Science Nines, and welcome to topic 2.1 of the Space Exploration Unit, Getting There, Technologies in Space Transport. Uh, we've discussed already quite a bit in the first topics of the unit about how humans have made a lot of discoveries in space using telescopes, but sometimes uh, actually getting equipment and people to the actual source, bringing them out into space, that's where a lot of these discoveries are also going to be made, uh, especially with... Uh, things that are closer to Earth, like uh, here in the solar system uh, and in the vicinity of uh, orbit around the planet or even heading to and from uh, the Earth's moon. Uh, so there needs to be uh, technologies in place uh, to make that happen. How did we go from essentially uh, a, a, a species or a civilization that didn't even know how to fly at the turn of the 20th century to uh, people that had actually made it to the moon uh, by 1969. So, and a lot of that had to do with technological advances that had occurred. And uh, most of these technological technologies all have to, they all have several things that they have to solve that are in common. There's several problems that occur when you send uh, machines or people into space. And these are all things that have to be sort of resolved by these technologies that we'll be discussing here today. Uh, first of all, you have to be able to break free from the Earth's gravity. That's big one. You, you have to be able to get up off the Earth. Once you get up off the Earth, you have to get out of the Earth's orbit at that point. Um, if you're going beyond the, uh, you know, like to the moon or saying a, a probe out to a planet in the solar system or, uh, you know, a planetary body somewhere, you know, in, in, in our neck of the woods. Uh, you also need to be able to keep the equipment running uh, properly in the, the extreme environment that is space. And uh, you have to be able to transport people to and from space if you're going to get people uh, into the to orbit around the Earth or send them uh, at this point as far as, as the moon, that's as far as we've gone with people. And uh, how do you communicate with equipment or people in space? These are all things that have to sort of be, uh, I guess, reckoned with when it comes to the, uh, to the technologies that are at play to get, uh, to, get um, to start exploring space is what I'm trying to get at. Um, here's a quick timeline of some of the the major events that occurred, and, and really things really did happen quickly. Uh, things really got rolling in the early 20th century. 1903, um, Tchaikovsky uh, basically published what he what became famous, the, the rocket equation, which was, was published. It concerns the relationship between how, uh, how fast a rocket has to go and the mass. So there's, a, there's a ratio between the, uh, the mass of the rocket and how much speed it requires to actually break out of the Earth's uh, out of the Earth's gravitational pull. So he, cal he calculated that, so that became a real, um, uh, I guess, a real mathematical force in how rockets could be sent into space because you, you could calculate uh, if a rocket was, was so big or so heavy, how much speed would it need to actually break free of the Earth's gravity. In uh, 1926, uh, Robert Goddard uh, successfully launches the, f the first liquid-fueled rocket. Uh, liquid became the, uh, the propellant of rockets uh, because it was more, you could control the reaction better and you could make it last a longer period of time. So liquid fuel became sort of the, the hallmark of pretty much all major rocketry after that. Uh, World War II, uh, the, the Nazis began developing the V-2 rockets in World War II um, and they, uh, one of their scientists, Ober, uh, basically developed theories on how to use a rocket to escape the Earth's gravity. So uh, Germans were sort of getting in on it, trying to figure out ways how they could get rockets, uh, you know, higher and, and, and further and even out of the Earth's gravitational pull. 1957, we finally get to see some stuff actually get into space. Um, the first satellite was launched by the Soviets in 57, Sputnik 1, so that, that happened. And then the Americans followed a year later in 58 with their first satellite known as Explorer 1. So the, so the, the space race began in 57. Uh, with the Americans and the Soviets basically trying to uh, figure out which ideology was superior. So it became sort of a uh, kind of a, a grudge match between these two superpowers as to which one could get, uh, you, you know, who could be the first person, to, who could get the first person in space, who could be the first person to get a, a, you know, something into orbit, who could be the first person eventually to the moon, which became the big push in the 1960s. Uh, the Russians early on, or the Soviets early on, uh, basically were beating the Americans at every turn. In 61, they had the first human in space. That was Gagarin in, in 61. Uh, 62, uh, interesting one, that, 
the Canadians got in on it. They, they, with the help of NASA, launched their first tele, telecommunication satellite, which was the Alouette one. So the Canadians got a, a satellite into orbit for telecommunications in 62. Uh, 1969, uh, Neil Armstrong steps foot onto the moon. Uh, in, uh, that was Apollo 11. Uh, so the, 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 and then after that, there were several Apollo missions after that. The last of two, I believe it was either 71 or 72. And then at that point, uh, humans basically just left the moon and, and so far have never come back. Now there is talk of new lunar missions that are coming out the, uh, uh, the, the, the next generation of, uh, of lunar exploration, uh, hopefully very, very soon here. Um, 1970, the first probe to land on another planet happened. That was uh, on Venus. That was Venera 7. The Soviets got that up to uh, Venus and landed an actual probe on Venus. So the first uh, ex uh, extra, I guess, extra planetary landing uh, occurred in 70. 81, the space shuttle missions began. Uh, the 80s were dominated by the space shuttles. 86, uh, the Challenger had the, the, the very uh, tragic uh, explosion of the Challenger. Space shuttle Challenger exploded uh, quick, uh, very shortly after takeoff. Seven crew members were killed. 1998, so that was about Twenty years ago now, or sorry, actually over thirty years ago. No, over twenty years ago. My math is bad when it comes to computer science. Um, the International Space Station, or the ISS, was put into orbit. Two thousand and one, the first space tourist paid twenty million dollars to ride in a Soyuz spacecraft. Um, Two thousand three, the Columbia, the space shuttle Columbia, burns up on reentry uh, as it's flying over Texas. Uh, it, it basically disintegrated because of some issues with uh, the heat shields. Uh, there were cracks in the heat shield that actually basically destroyed the, uh, the, the shuttle blew up, or I mean disintegrated on re-entry uh, with all the friction coming back into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, 2008, uh, private company SpaceX launches its first, um, uh, I guess, rocket, uh, the Falcon 1. Uh, 2011, space shuttle program is mothballed and scrapped. The last space shuttles are launched in 2011. Uh, 2012, Voyager 1, which was launched back in the 1970s, becomes the first man-made probe to enter interstellar space. It actually exits our solar system and heads out into the vacuum of space. So basically, it's the first human probe to actually leave our solar system. Um, all of these technologies over these years, and I would never expect you to remember any of the specific dates of those, but they're all based on one simple technology, which is sort of at the heart of today's lesson, and that's rocketry. So how does a rocket work? Well, a rocket works, it's basically divided into three parts, a rocket. You've got uh, the structural elements on the outside, the casing, the engines, all the, the hardware that's on that rocket. You then have a very small section of the rocket which is dedicated to the payload, which is whatever the, the rocket is carrying into space, whether it's people or supplies. Uh, it's a very small area. And remember, this goes back to that rocket equation. The, the heavier the rocket is, the more speed and the more fuel you need to actually break free of the Earth's orbit. So there, there is there, there is sort of a finite amount of payload that a rocket can carry before it runs out of uh, you know space to, to house the fuel to get it sufficient uh, velocity to actually get out of the Earth's gravitational pull or up into orbit. And that's what most of the rocket is on the inside. You've got fuel, which is a majority of the fuel uh, uh, the space on the inside of a rocket. And this is traditionally now, it's mainly liquid oxygen and hydrogen that are basically brought together and they actually form water in a reaction that actually produces a huge amount of force. And how these rockets work is a work on uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, his third law of motion. Uh, he proposed several laws of motion. The third one, which is a very famous law of motion that he proposed, he said that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So essentially the rocket is producing a force that's in a downward direction, that is going to cause an opposite reaction of the rocket moving in an upward direction away from the Earth. So that's how rockets essentially work. Um, and a rocket is essentially just a giant mass engine. And if you want to see how a rocket works, watch this video. Great little uh, look at rocketry and everything that's involved in it. Um, I hope you enjoy it because it, it, it is a great little video. Um, and there you go. So that's basically rocketry, and that's it. It's a pretty short topic for today's discussion. For homework, as I had up on the other board, you might have already noticed on the other board, I, mean, I kind of did my boards backwards today, but, you know, whatever, it happens. Uh, for today's uh, homework, 
complete question one, three, four, and six on page 417 of the textbook. Um, next time, I'm going to be discussing technologies that allow us to live in space. If we're going to actually get people to live in space, and there are people who do spend you know, some amount of time in space up on the ISS, the International Space Station, and if we want to maybe send people eventually to Mars, which is one of another big discussions that are happening right now, uh, what do we need to have in play to help those people live in space? So that'll be my topic next time, which will be 2.2. Until then, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you later.